Good morning, everybody, and thank you for uh, joining us here very early on a, on a Friday morning in the Palais. Thank you for attending this joint side event organized by the International Service for Human Rights, ADC Memorial, the FIDH, and the East and Horn of Africa Human Rights Defenders Project. We're very happy to have such a full room on, on such, at such an early time, and we're particularly pleased, obviously, to have many ambassadors here in the room as well, um, and I think that really testifies to the importance that you all attach to the topic that we're discussing today. Before I go any further, there's translation. Uh, English is on channel 2 and French is on, on channel 3. So for those of you who prefer uh, French en français, vous pouvez écouter sur le canal 3. I'm Mike Linak from the International Service for Human Rights and I'll be your moderator today. Um, before explaining the, the format very briefly, I want to warmly welcome our panelists today and, and uh, our speakers today. Um, I'll start in the order that they, they will uh, speak today. Um, uh, on the far left, Olivier de Frouville, who is a uh, member of the, working, the UN Working Group on Enforced and Involuntary Disappearance and a member-elect of the UN Human Rights Committee. Um, he will have to leave a little bit earlier, so we'll deliver some, some opening remarks. Um, to my right is Stefania Kuleyeva from the Anti-Discrimination Centre Memorial, which is a member of the FIDH, so she's representing both ADC Memorial and FIDH. ADC Memorial is uh, an organisation that's promoting the rights of minorities and Roma in, in Russia. Um, Stefani has worked there since, since the year 2000, and has, has worked both in Russia and the neighboring countries on, on Roma rights. Um, in the last years, more and more effort, however, has been given to, to fighting for freedom of expression, defending of, of <coughs> protesters, political artists and activists, with a special attention on the LGBTI persons. Um, to my left is uh, Patricia O'Brien, the ambassador of Ireland, and one of the greatest champions of civil society space here at the Council and, and also globally. Thank you, Ambassador, for, for being here. Um, uh, Pucha Patel, on, uh, to uh, Stefania's right, is ISA, uh, ISHR colleague working previously, many of you know her as the Geneva representative of, of Forum Asia. She replaces Eleanor Openshaw, who um, is stuck uh, due to flight problems, and Clément Boulet, um, most relevantly to this discussion, he's a member of the steering committee of the African Commission NGO Forum and also a member of the African Commission uh, Working Group on Extractive Industries and Human Rights. He is, has kindly agreed to step in for, for Ray Nalapini Gansu, who due to the uh, um, staff of Air France taking uh, their right to strike is now stuck in, in, in Bina. So I'm, I'm really delighted to have such a, a, a great panel here, and um, we'll kick off shortly. Before doing so, I just want to briefly explain the, the format of this discussion. We want to really keep this as, as interactive as possible, so that will require the, the active engagement of all of you. Um, Olivier de Fruwil will, will, will kick us off with some opening remarks, and will leave us with some probing questions and, and ideas. I also want to welcome uh, Ambassador Lara Dupi of Uruguay, uh, former president of the Human Rights Council, and in that, in that function, a, a great defender also of, of the space for civil society and the security of, of human rights defenders here in Geneva. Um, Ambassador, welcome. Uh, so after Olivier de Fruwil will kick off the discussion, and I will try to separate that in, in three clusters. First cluster will look at, at, at the problem, so what is the evolution of civil society space in, in, in recent years, um, both negatively and, and positively, but I think we'll see that a lot of the, the evolution has been towards a tightening of, of, of that space. We will look then secondly at efforts both nationally, regionally and internationally to address that problem and to, to, to respond to the shrinking of, of the space. And then in the third cluster, try to look ahead and, and see what different actors could do in order to, to, to actually boost the, the response. As I said, we'd like to make it as interactive as possible, so I've asked panelists to also be brief in, in, their, in, in the responses to questions. And I would invite you also to um, 
ask questions at any time by raising your hand or, or flag. Um, again, it'd be great if you could state your affiliate, your name, affiliation, and also be brief in your comments or questions. Um, finally, we're filming this event and also taking some pictures, so if any of you have any concerns about being seen in, in the film, which will then be published uh, later, please approach my colleagues who will do that. Um, on Twitter, for those of you who are um, tweeting, you, you may use the hashtag ProtectCSS, Protect Civil Society Space, to both ask questions um, that my colleague Phil will then put, or uh, to obviously tweet about this event. Um, so without further ado, let me hand over to Olivier. Thanks again for being here for opening this panel. <laughs> Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, on Monday I attended with great emotion a parallel event with Estela de Carlotto, the courageous and inspiring president of the Abuelas de la Plaza de Mayo in Argentina. At the end of the event, Estela took the floor and there was a long round of applause and finally a standing ovation. Everybody, including myself, felt so happy to see her in this position at the podium in a panel composed partly of states, all acknowledging a fantastic courage and dedication. I think one of the reasons we felt so happy was that we realized that 30 years ago, the grandmothers fought amongst the NGOs in this building to have their message heard, while their, no, their own state and others accused them of being at best politically biased and at worst accomplice of the terrorists. Estella told us that she was only a normal person, that she did what she thought she ought to do, and that there were many persons like her in the world. And I couldn't help thinking, when, will be the, when there will be a standing ovation for this lady who, while she was heard by my working group this week, burst into tears when she told us how she had been harassed in the airport on her way to Geneva. Today I have bad news and a good news for you. The bad news is that we still live in a world where peaceful protesters, human rights defenders, independent journalists are called traitors of the nation, foreign agents, criminals or fools, whereas the people who imprison or torture them are called officials of the state or sovereign leaders. But the good news is that there are more and more people who find this insane. And it is not only the civil society. More and more state officials understand that the state's role is to protect its citizens, but also to create an enabling environment for them to express themselves and flourish as full-fledged citizens. I think that the debate that we are having today, as well as the debates that took place, that are, that are taking place in the Council, are clear indications of this trend. 20 years ago, it would have been difficult to speak of civil society space in this building. Today, we all know that the system wouldn't just work without the NGOs. It would be an empty shell. This growing <coughs> role of civil society has its backlash. More violence comes great, with greater influence. Human rights defenders, bloggers, peaceful protesters, youngsters who just want to have fun and be happy and express their happiness, they all face growing repression. As civil society is gaining more power, its space is shrinking in many countries, facing multiple legal obstacles and repression. We already have tools to combat this trend. For instance, the special procedures are sending urgent appeals whenever human rights defenders or, for my working group, families or people who are working on cases of enforced disappearances are threatened or subjected to reprisals. In my experience, these calls are quite effective. They give a strong signal to the state concerned that the person is not isolated and that should something happen, it will be widely known and publicized. But we need even more efficient tools. We need an authority to raise the profile of these cases, react urgently to our calls, and bring it to the attention of the state's concern. This is why it is so important that the Human Rights Council's Resolution 24 slash 24 that the creation of the UN focal point on reprisals be endorsed by the General Assembly as soon as possible. This is why also it is so important that states consider the possibility of appointing national focal points on this issue. 
But it is not only at the domestic level that we should do more to protect and enable civil society's participation. In the UN also, progresses can be made. First, a long, long time ago, NGOs used not to be allowed to name countries before the Human Rights Commission. It's hard to believe that we could come back to such a practice today. Rules of procedure in the UN must be interpreted in the light of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and of the Declaration on Human Rights Defenders. And there must be clear rulings in this Council so as to enforce freedom of expression. It is a shame that this Council, whose mission is to promote and protect human rights, allows for undue limitations to freedom of expression during its debates. Second, there must be an independent and impartial mechanism to decide which civil society organization is allowed to participate in the debate of this Council. And there should be an independent and impartial assessment of their contribution to the work of the Council. In brief, the committee on NGOs <coughs> sitting in New York must be changed. Finally, the UN should accept that it has a responsibility in ensuring the security and well-being of those who are cooperating with its procedures. This is, a necessary, this is necessary when experts are visiting countries and after they have left. And this is also true for those persons who are coming to Geneva to testify and who need to be offered psychological support and to feel that they can safely go back to their countries without fearing any reprisals. In brief, the UN should be the protection program for the benefit of those who are cooperating with it. In other words, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we need to take the necessary measures so that those who are the Estela de Carlotos of tomorrow, like Stefania, for instance, get the protection they can rightly expect for the UN. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Olivier, for, for setting the scene and, and for giving us uh, some food for thought. I, I was particularly struck also by what, what you said at the, at the outset, namely that the importance of really individual leadership. Um, of course, there's an obligation of states, but states are not monolithic and there's individual leadership. And I think the role that many of the diplomats here in Geneva play to try and protect human rights defenders is really a testimony to that and, and, and has to be acknowledged as well. Um, let's, let's kick off the discussion uh, on the first cluster, namely how, how is the, the environment for civil society uh, evolving? What is the, the trajectory that reprisals have, have been taking um, in, in recent months and, and years? I, I would now turn first to, to Stefania. Um, as many in the room here know, ADC Memorial has to Ha, ha, was forced to seize operations from w within Russia following the passage of what is commonly known as the foreign agents law. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on, on what the limitations were that, that really forced you to then stop operating from within Russia? Uh, well, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak about uh, the difficulties you uh, right defenders face in Russia. And uh, thank you for inviting me here. It's true that the ABC Memorial is an organization uh, that was mostly opposing discrimination, promoting the rights of minorities through advocacy, which of course includes the international advocacy, writing reports to UN uh, special committees. Uh, was um, recognized as foreign agents. It was a third organization in Russia text uh, on this new law. And uh, it's the only ground in official accusation of the prosecutor recognized by two courts was uh, to see us as a foreign agent and an organization dangerous for security and um, well-being of Russian state was our report <coughs> on against torture. Uh, we did just one of the complementary alternative reports uh, indicating problems of um, Roma migrants and uh, activists, political activists, LGBTI activists, uh, who often become victims of the police abuse, um, regular checkups, ethnic profiling, all such things. It, this report was presented in the beginning of November 2012. In the beginning of uh, 2013, this law came into force, and the prosecutors came to our office, found this report, actually one of the raw materials, and said this report um, is the only ground to call us a foreign agent and join. And the new law of foreign agents makes it impossible to operate if you are recognized as a foreign agent and put in a special register of uh, organizations, uh, NGOs, foreign agents, 
Uh, that means a lot of restrictions, but it also means absolutely no trust from your clients, absolutely impossible to cooperate with the state structures, and actually impossible to accept for us stigma, because we are not foreign agents, and even though we never denied that we received some foreign funding for our work, but we only saw it as a source of independence and possibility to work alternatively to, um, to the state report, which is also what we're doing with the UN. Um, However, uh, this uh, list was created, and originally NGOs were supposed to put themselves in this list. If they recognize that they are both for uh, funding and doing so-called political activities, they have to register themselves. That's why our organization, by two courts, was obliged to put ourselves in the register. As we didn't want to do it, and not fulfilling a court decision is also impossible for legal reasons, we preferred to close this organization, but we didn't close our activities, we didn't stop doing things that we find important. We still see uh, the big trouble of minorities. I mean, Human Rights Defenders and Trouble in Russia, but uh, LGBTI activists, um, ethnic minorities, migrants are in big trouble too, and therefore we continue our activities, we continue publishing reports. We put there some joint reports with FIDH, uh, they were <coughs> here also. I brought another one, Restriction on the Right to Express the Critical Opinion. And this work continues, so also again, bad news and good news, and only good news that we continue working, regardless of the fact that there are no more registration issues. Thank you very much, Stefania, for, for sharing this, this very powerful um, testimony. If I, if I can just, just follow up, um, given that you're no longer working within Russia itself, um, how, has that, how has that concretely impacted your colleagues who then do actually gather information and monitor the human rights situation? What, what's the concrete impact on the space that they have available? Well, obviously we do have problems. We can continue the work, we still have a lot of materials gathered, and we keep gathering and monitoring the situation. But, for example, providing real aid became much more difficult, because that was another aspect of our work, except of doing uh, monitoring, reporting, advocacy work. We've been usually react immediately on every problem we see by providing immediate legal aid. And unfortunately, which I see as a great pity not only for us, but also for our clients, it became quite difficult because of the enormous pressure we put on our clients. Just one example, uh, this summer, a very big group of Roma that we've been supporting for more than 10 years were forced, by being threatened with the demolishment of their old homes, were forced to write a letter to the General Prosecutor of Russia saying they don't want to be defended by ADC memorials, they don't want their human rights and especially the rights of the children to be protected by anybody, and they ask the General Prosecutor of Russia to defend them from ADC memorials. These are the people who we've been helping for more than 10 years, who have been happy with our help, and such things are published now. We've been publishing also our website. Um, that's, of course, is a big obstacle, and not only for us, unfortunately, all human rights and children Russia is Thank you, Stefania. Um, Patricia, Ireland is, is running obviously a critical resolution again at this session of the, of the Human Rights Council um, on the promotion and protection of civil society space. Um, what, what has been your analysis that has, has prompted Ireland to, to run this resolution? And have you observed any change in the climate for civil society globally or at the Council since you, since you developed this focus? Well, thank you very much, Michael, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and an honor to have been asked to speak on this panel. Um, I have been the Irish ambassador here for one year, and the first uh, issue that I had to address was the question of civil society space and the resolution which Ireland had um, taken the initiative with a core group to put forward to the Council this time last year. Um, I have noticed a number of different evolutions, if you like, over the course of the year. But if I could start with the very basic, obvious um, principle that we firmly believe that protecting civil society space and preventing reprisals is essential to the obvious peace and security development and human rights. And one of the evolving arguments which we've encountered while discussing the promotion and protection of civil society space is that this is about new rights and additional protection. At times when I have heard this argument, I have felt 
that those who oppose or wish for a post civil society space or wish for its shrinkage are using this as a sort of clutching at straws because from my perspective it's beyond argument that it does not create new rights or additional protection. My background is that of a lawyer and so I see this in very clear terms. It isn't a question of creating new rights. I'm sure I don't need to say this to this audience. It's not a question of additional protections. What we're talking about here is the fulfillment of existing rights, the, the clear and obvious rights of freedom of association, freedom of assembly, freedom of opinion, freedom of expression. This is second nature, I'm sure, to everybody in the room. But these are, of course, essential ingredients to enable civil society actors to carry out their work work which facilitates the achievement of the purposes and objects of the UN. Um, protecting civil society space is aimed at ensuring civil society can enjoy the same human rights to which everyone is entitled. But I think one of the things that I have learned over the year is to constantly emphasize the primary responsibility of states. And that means, of course, governments to protect human rights and in that way to protect civil society space. Unfortunately, as we know, and this is why we're here, the full enjoyment of human rights by civil society actors is not being realized and is constantly under threat. So it was in that spirit that we, with the cross-regional group, brought forward our resolution last year to address the issue of civil society space and its protection as a human rights concern. And um, while the focus of the resolution was on the important role of civil society at all levels, and of course that's local, national, regional, international, we have seen, as has already been mentioned, um, um, in fact has been the focus already of our discussion, is the, the increasing attempts to undermine the space uh, for civil society. And if I might just then address something which I think is going to be also very much the focus of our discussion, is the threats to civil society within the council. And I think this is becoming more and more a concern for us. In practical terms, many NGOs on a constant and regular basis are being interrupted during, and this is the practical reality, during their statements on procedural grounds. The arguments presented are usually very spurious, certainly as far as we are concerned, of incorrect <coughs> agenda, substance of the statement, accreditation of the speaker, speaker, and the list goes on. The Human Rights Council, we all know, is, is a forum for open dialogue, for sharing opinions and experiences. It's not a debating forum, but it is a forum in which, if ever there was a space where freedom of expression should be allowed to flourish, it is the Human Rights Council. And of course, we have seen these threats on a regular basis. But I know, Michael, that you want to focus on that particular point, so I'll finish with that very general introduction from my perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Patricia, for giving us uh, an outline of, of the motivations for Ireland to run this resolution. Um, Clement, the, the, the African Commission has recently passed a resolution tasking the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders of the Commission as a reprisal's focal point, and we will come back to the institutional development um, in the second cluster. For now, I'd be interested, as a, an African human rights defender, how do you see the, the evolution of the space for civil society on the continent? Um, we've obviously heard from Stefania how, how the space is shrinking in Russia. What is, what is the situation on the African continent? <coughs> Je vais faire un procès à la tradition, puis peut-être à vos casques. Est-ce qu'il y a une interprétation en français Oui, je crois que je vais faire justice à l'interprète français aussi. Euh, merci, Michael, pour cette, cette question. Euh, je voudrais, avant de commencer, d'abord présenter toutes les excuses de Mme à la présidence, comme Michael l'a dit. Elle a voulu être ici. On a essayé de voir si elle pouvait intervenir Pascal. Mais malheureusement, le, le débit est assez faible à, à data. Euh, donc, je suis ici pour pouvoir vous donner quelques informations par rapport à la question des représailles, surtout de l'espace de la société civile. Je voudrais d'abord dire qu'il faut voir la question sur deux ans. D'abord, depuis les années 2000, 
il y a une restriction que l'on a constatée au niveau national d'abord. De plus en plus de lois qui concernent dans des domaines particuliers où les pays essaient de, de réduire l'espace de la société civile. Et la Commission l'a d'ailleurs constaté déjà dans, dans pas mal de résolutions. Euh, la résolution, 2000, la résolution euh, 218 qui concernait par exemple l'Éthiopie avait déjà soulevé un certain nombre de préoccupations sur les lois qui tendent à restreindre l'espace le, de la société civile à travers des restrictions sur le, la, la liberté de parole et d'information en Éthiopie. Mais aussi, la Commission avait déjà constaté, même en 2014 récemment, la question de la restriction de l'espace de la société civile lorsqu'il lorsqu s'agit des élections en Afrique. Comme vous le savez, les élections sont toujours un problème très éprouvant en Afrique et la participation de la société civile est généralement la garantie des élections transparentes. Mais de plus en plus, nous avons pu constater que les États essaient de mettre des restrictions pour que la société civile n'ait pas le droit ou ne puisse pas participer au processus électoral en vue de pouvoir euh, pratiquer des élections. Et comme vous le savez, l'Union africaine, y compris d'ailleurs les systèmes régionaux, ont adopté d'ailleurs ce principe des élections libres et actuellement il y a aussi un protocole à, à la, pour la démocratie et les élections en Afrique qui tente d'ailleurs, qui souffre actuellement de ratification. Donc il y a cette tendance-là. Mais il y a aussi d'autres tendances qui consistent sur des aspects spécifiques et thématiques. La Commission africaine, à travers son rapport, d'ailleurs, avait déjà soulevé l'année passée ses préoccupations par rapport au, à, à la réduction de l'espace de la société civile à travers des restrictions au niveau du, du travail sur certaines questions thématiques qu'on qu a parlé de sensibles, y compris la question de euh, l'homosexualité la, la euh, au Nigeria, y compris la question de, de l'homosexualité en Ouganda. Et toutes ces résolutions avaient constaté et rappelé ces deux pays sur la nécessité de laisser la société civile pour travailler sur le principe de la Déclaration des Nations Unies pour que la société civile s'occupe de toutes les thématiques. Et nous avons aussi constaté euh, depuis 2001, comme je, je le soulevais tout à l'heure, la question aussi de la restriction de l'espace de la société sur des questions économiques et sur des questions de la transparence, où pas mal de pays actuellement adoptent des législations qui parfois tendent à, 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 à imposer à la société civile de ne pas intervenir dans des domaines qui constituent ce que l'on appelle généralement des domaines de souveraineté ou des domaines de prix, des, des, des domaines, euh, je, disons, des, des domaines de, de sécurité, je dirais comme ça, parce que la plupart, beaucoup de pays africains pensent aujourd'hui que la société civile qui intervient, ou les ONG qui travaillent dans les domaines d'extraction, qui, qui, qui questionnent un peu les questions liées au contrat, au contrat interviennent dans un domaine qui n'est pas le leur. Parce que la question des droits économiques et sociaux qui était pendant longtemps a été vue comme un domaine réservé de l'État. Et de plus en plus d'ONG qui constituent à intervenir dans ce domaine sont au fond l'objet de restrictions en termes de repas. On ne leur donne pas l'information sur la question budgétaire, ils n'ont pas d'informations sur les contrats. Et tous ceux qui tentent d'obtenir ces contrats-là, parfois, font face à des questions de, de secret d'État ou de l'État. Il y a tout ce phénomène-là. Mais ce que nous avons vu tout récemment aussi, c'est que le phénomène s'est déplacé un peu plus au niveau régional. Où même, durant les sessions du, de, de la Commission africaine, la plus, plus, beaucoup d'États, soit à travers des motions de procédure ou à travers aussi euh, euh, des, des questions liées à, disons, beaucoup d'États qui, qui commencent même à questionner même le processus d'accréditation de, du statut d'observateur de la Commission qui est un processus connu par les États et qui est clair que la Commission est seule juge des ONG. Mais nous avons vu tout récemment l'Éthiopie, l'Ouganda et un certain nombre de pays demander à la Commission quelles sont les procédures, pourquoi est-ce que ces ONG. Donc, et nous avons aussi en, en 2014, durant, en 2014, cette année d'ailleurs, durant la session au Canada, et la Commission a été telle que la présidente de la Commission a été obligée de rappeler à tous les États l'importance de préserver l'espace le, de la société civile comme acteur incontournable dans le travail de la Commission africaine. Et elle est allée d'ailleurs plus loin en disant que 
euh, porter atteinte à l'espace de, de la société civile et exercer des représailles contre l'espace de la société civile, c'est une insulte à la Commission africaine parce que la Commission africaine est à même de juger de la fiabilité des informations qui nous sont fournies. Et vous pouvez trouver toutes ces, ces déclarations sur le site de la Commission. Donc c'est pour dire que l'espace de la restriction a évolué du niveau national vers le niveau régional. Et ce qui est de plus en plus inquiétant, parce que cela restreint la, la capacité euh, de la société civile, et y compris les experts des droits de l'homme de faire le travail de droit de l'homme de faire. Merci beaucoup Clément. Um, thanks in, in particular for also showing how it, the, the restrictions evolved from a purely national context to also the, the context at the African Commission. Um, I think like um, uh, Ambassador O'Brien has outlined and, and Olivier before, I, in, in many ways that's also a testimony to the effectiveness and the, you know, the, the fact that, that it stinks when civil society works at the regional and, and international levels. And I think despite this being a negative development, we can also be proud in some way of that. Um, we've, we've heard now examples from, from Eastern Europe and, 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 and Africa, but of course reprisals and intimidation against human rights defenders is, is a global phenomenon. We have found this recently, uh, again very clearly, when we researched um, around the production of a, a short film on reprisals, which we're going to show now, um, that it's really a, a phenomenon that, that, that touches human rights defenders around the world. Um, it's a short, about eight minute film, we'll watch that and then we can resume the discussion. Chao Zhenli is not the first one who died this way. Activists submitting reports to the UN are subjected to retaliation. You find that every step you, you can be um, stopped, silenced, persecuted, harassed. The government of Sri Lanka needs to live up to its commitment made during this special session to relieve resettlement and rehabilitation of the displaced. That three minutes I heard this statement changed my whole life. It makes you really, you know, kind of a walking dead. Reprisals and acts of intimidation can have a, a chilling effect on human rights activism. They happen around the world and in, in various different contexts. We've seen cases of reprisals engaging with a range of different UN human rights mechanisms, and many of them have suffered intimidation or reprisals for that work. <coughs> Strength and uh, strategically and doggedly to document, to, to collect all the signatures and stories, and she wanted to um, disclose uh, in, you know, corruption and, uh, and unfair um, solutions. And the more you want to express your view, the more you want to say about the injustice that you have witnessed, and the harsher. The persecution. A flagrant case of deadly reprisal is that of Chinese human rights defender Chao Xun Li. While in prison, Ms. Chao was denied proper medical attention and died last week as a result. She paid with her life for her conviction that the United Nations top human rights body 
would offer civil society some of the space that human rights defenders are denied at home in China. school in Colombo and um, all her friends stopped talking to her, only one student talk and talked to her saying she's come from a traitor's family. <clears throat> and on the radio every day they were saying that this man has to be killed. State media said that my family should be stoned to death. Everyone, even from ambassadors uh, to the politicians, so everyone said don't even think of coming back. shamed very quickly, everyone started to think twice, why do I want to do this? It, it clearly underscores the human cost and the human impact of, of reprisals. Um, Puja, Del, you've been, you've been watching the evolution of, of, um, of reprisals and the impact it has on both individuals but also the different uh, UN human rights mechanisms concerned. Um, could you elaborate a bit on what you see as, as the impact, uh, I think um, Tsunanda hinted at it in the film, but if you can elaborate on what you see as the impact on the mechanisms themselves. Thank you, Michael, and it's nice to see everyone here today. Um, I think it is worth repeating one of the things that came out in this video, because it's worth repeating again and again, which is that states have a moral and a legal duty to ensure that all persons are free to access the UN human rights system without fear of harassment and attacks. States have the primary responsibility, however, the Human Rights Council, its mechanisms, the treaty bodies also have a very important role to play. In most instances, again as the video has highlighted, uh, reprisals are perpetrated with impunity. This means that it fuels recurrence. It can happen again and again, and especially in the case of, let's say, Sri Lanka, it has happened systematically every single session of the Human Rights Council since the special session in 2009. We have been aware of ongoing and new cases of reprisals. There is a shocking lack of response from those country concerns to provide information on these allegations. <coughs> the effect that this has on the UN human rights mechanisms is actually that there is an increased um, reluctance <coughs> coming from a place of fear of many victims and, and witnesses to engage and cooperate, um, particularly when it comes to um, sending communications on cases to the special procedures and also physically coming to Geneva to um, participate in the Human Rights Council sessions. Um, back home, it has created a chilling effect in many national human rights movements. Um, many human rights defenders don't feel secure in their cooperation with the UN human rights system. What this means <coughs> is that how can the human rights system of the UN continue to be victim-centered when in fact the victims themselves cannot provide the information <coughs> they want to provide. Um, if I can also say that the region that I'm from in Asia, there are no regional mechanisms. Um, in many countries, the national institutions, the judiciary tend to be weak. The only recourse that many victims have in so many countries in this world is here at the UN. And that's why this is a sacred space in that sense. And that's why it's important to tackle reprisals. 
Thank you very much, uh, Pucha. Um, if I may now invite uh, Ambassador Dupi to, to maybe, if I can direct the question to you. During, during your presidency, you've, you've been really a, a, a critical voice, and you've really tried to make sure, if I can borrow a Pucha's quote, to, to keep the Human Rights Council a sacred place for those who, who need this, this space to, to have their voice heard. Um, since then, how do you see the the, um, the the challenges and the evolution um, of, of the, this space here? And what, what steps is, is Uruguay envisaging to take both um, bilaterally but also through the Council to follow up on, on cases and, and strengthen follow up to those instances of reprisals more broadly? Many thanks, Michael, for this invitation to referring uh, to this important issue, uh, which, uh, as you mentioned, I, I felt uh, very close uh, when exercising the, the presidency of the Council. I, some, some may also question the role of a president, but of course uh, having the Council condemned very clearly in 2011 all reprisals and intimidations to persons who cooperate or family or relatives of these persons. Um, it's most natural that the, the president or vice president, when exercising their role, uh, uphold to this uh, to this uh, message, to this strong uh, uh, commitment, uh, collective commitment by the council because it was adopted by consensus. So, so there's a role there that should be um, secure in the future, let's say, or improving in the future if, if possible. It's, it's really a humanitarian task as I perceive it, and that's why I, when I had to intervene, I intervened on that basis. Uh, it's a little bit like the working group on disappearances, but then you, you work when it's already done, uh, just to find the whereabouts of a person for the family purposes. But uh, in this case, it's more preventive. So. Uruguay has uh, not only personally, but Uruguay shares the view that this uh, council, the UN, needs to uh, invest more in prevention. We are, uh, in general terms, through budgetary resources allocated for peace and security, investing in other things rather than in prevention. And uh, so there's, there are structural things that the UN could be doing, like uh, putting more on national capabilities and human rights. <coughs> This is what we do also nationally, uh, the framework rule of law, etc. And, and so, well, we, we hope to, to secure freedom of expression. It was mentioned as well, the, the, the kind of a, a attempts to cut the voice uh, of, of NGOs. <coughs> Definitely when I was uh, there, and I had to also manage the adoption of rules for um, video statements. I apply the same rules, and when there was an attempt to say how do we cut the, uh, the film, because it was a video message, if there are things that are inappropriate, I think the, uh, I explain how we would act, and we agreed on in writing how we would act, and I say in any way the council would be the one to cut the freedom of expression. So uh, it was clear, and it was also adopted by consensus. So I think there, there's a, still a lot of space, and we hope that the office and the Secretary General will help uh, improving uh, this debate. Thank you very much, Ambassador Dupi. Um, before we move on to, to the next cluster, to really go more in, in depth to see what are the, the developments to respond to the sometimes bleak picture that we've, we've now seen, I want to open the, see if there's any questions on, um, from the audience on this first cluster, i.e. The, the analysis of the problem, the, um, <coughs> What is the evolution of the space for, for civil society? If there's any questions for the panel as a whole or, or for individual panelists, um, now would be a good moment. Don't worry, I've got more questions. But I see a gentleman in the blue shirt. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Ed Muniakani, South Sudanese human rights defender. Um, in this session, I'm interested in sharing my testimonies in regards to the evolution of the situation. I'm nearly prevented to come here in Juba last week. I was delayed, my passport was confiscated for 25 minutes. But the content in South Sudan is now getting a bit challenging, whereby in my case, airline companies were contacted not to give me air tickets. 
like Ethiopian embassy in Juba, the ambassador honestly told me, we are warned, we're given a picture that we should have given you a visa to go to Ethiopia in order to get a visa to come here. So mine is my colleague from Africa, and I'm, I have a concern of getting back home, my safety, my protection. And as he said, is that always, such cases are picked up after somebody gets lost or somebody lost their life. What can I get as a response in a situation like mine? Thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, this is a tough question, but um, wait, we will cast it, you will play. Uh, yeah, I think we have talked about, we have talked about the aparté par rapport à la question, and I think that this is a very important question that we have to take au sérieux. And it's not even the first time that the defenseurs soudanais have been empêchés to pouvoir voyager. Et d'ailleurs, la mise en place et le renforcement de la résolution de la Commission africaine pour combattre les représailles a été aussi justifié par certains défenseurs soudanais qui avaient été publiquement au niveau de la Commission africaine empêchés de parler. Donc cela veut dire que ça devient une préoccupation importante que le Conseil et la Commission africaine doivent prendre en compte. Et, euh, Je suggère, d'ailleurs, comme je l'ai suggéré à mon ami, de, de contacter directement le bureau du nouveau commissariat. Et généralement, on a l'impression, nous avons, en nous minimisant ces gens d'actes, mais nous savons ce que cela peut représenter lorsque la personne retrouve chez elle. Pas dans un mois, pas, pas dans une semaine, pas dans un mois, pas dans deux mois, mais en six mois, peut-être qu'on le retrouvera plus. Je ne le souhaite pas pour mon ami, mais je pense quand même qu'il y a. Il y a besoin que l'on puisse lui donner les garanties nécessaires pour qu'il puisse retourner chez lui. Et d'après l'historique qui m'a raconté sur ce qui s'est passé, je crois quand même qu'il y a eu une intention de l'empêcher de sortir du pays. Et puisqu'il a fait, alors il y aura aussi, je pense, des représailles qui m'attendraient au pays lorsqu'il va retourner. Mais qu'est-ce qu'il faut faire Je n'ai pas la solution tout faite ici, mais je pense que c'est la responsabilité du bureau du haut commissariat de pouvoir donner te donner les assurances nécessaires et la protection nécessaire. Thank you Clément and, and uh, since as you said there's no plug and play solution there's no ready ready step that we can just take to 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 really protect Edward right now um, I want to now explore a little bit what what are some of the so far tentative responses at both international, regional and national levels to respond to the shrinkage of space. Um, Patricia, what concretely are you going to contribute with your initiative on civil society space to protect people like Edward and to make sure that the space for civil society both at home and here remains open? Well, thank you very much. Um, following on, this question, what I'm going to say about Ireland's initiative and the support which we've received is not going to answer this question. But in the broader context, we have to try to move forward one step at a time and our resolution and what we're trying to do at this session is really one small further step. It's not the big picture, and it's not the small but vital answer to your question. But the end result of this one step and the steps which should follow should be the protection of people like you, and in fact, the inhibition of states in acting as you do. So just very briefly on the more prosaic level of exactly what it is that we're doing, as I mentioned earlier, we have our initiative, the first resolution, which you're all familiar with, 2421, was adopted by consensus in September of last year. That resolution requested the establishment of a panel to have a discussion on the way forward for the protection of civil society space. We held the panel in March. We considered that it was very successful, extremely well attended, and, uh, and the uh, results were promulgated uh, around the world. A summary report of that panel discussion was prepared by OHCHR as requested for this session. So the question now is what are we out there in the Serpentine and in our rooms here doing every minute of the day at the moment and the pressures are, are enormous. 
All we're trying to do is to achieve consensus at this session on the follow-up from that panel discussion. And the follow-up action which the draft is seeking is the simple issue of the compilation of practical recommendations for the creation and maintenance of a safe and enabling environment. So what does that actually mean? <coughs> it's a compilation of best practices within states. And I have to say from my, my intensive experience over the last number of days, one of the points which I personally make on a constant basis to ambassadors who are, if you like, on the other end of the spectrum, or who are concerned, who come from states who, which are concerned about this resolution. I say in certain instances, your practices, in certain instances, your practices in particular areas are actually an example to the rest of the world, in particular areas, to encourage them to see this as a non-threatening issue. It's difficult, and sometimes, of course, we know it's going to be virtually impossible. But to try, as a diplomat, to identify how to encourage them that this is not an out-and-out criticism of states, but to where appropriate to identify best practices. In certain, for example, certain African states, there are one or two practices that we don't have in my country, which we would look to once they identify them in the course of this exercise of developing best practices. So these best practices, we are hoping, will be compiled from around the world so that we can filter them down and look at them and then disseminate them as essentially um, guidances and advice and ultimately um, obligations of states to follow. So we think that this will be a valuable and practical tool, but as I said at the outset, it's not the answer to your question, but it is that one step in the direction, and it's a difficult one to achieve, and our ambition is to achieve consensus, and I think that is really, really important for this session. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia, and, and as important, obviously, as the longer-term political work is to, to, that you've just outlined, there have been some more, more practical in, in uh, at least in UN terms, um, taken by some of the other mechanisms, um, including treaty body special procedures. Uja, what are those developments, and why why could they be important for addressing the situation? Yeah. Um, so as you said, there have been a number of developments which are noteworthy, and um, perhaps many of you are aware of some of them already. Um, the treaty, a number of treaty bodies, in fact, have recognized the need to ensure um, a more systematic approach amongst themselves on cases of reprisals. And some of them have created uh, rapporteurs or focal points within their committees on reprisals, particularly the Human Rights Committee, the Committee on Enforced Disappearances, the, the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and the Committee Against Torture. There are other committees may not have any formal procedures in place, but we see that they have been um, taking more efforts to address the reprisals by raising allegations with the state concerned during its review. Um, the special procedures have developed a protocol for handling individual cases of reprisals. The Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders acts as a focal point for reprisals amongst all of the, the special procedures. Um, and there is also training for new mandate holders um, who are appointed on how to um, handle communications and country visits with the view to prevent reprisals or to act upon cases of reprisals. Um, and of course, as Ambassador Dupuy has mentioned as well, um, there has been a precedent set at the Human Rights Council by previous presidents um, and their bureaus on addressing um, allegations of reprisals by bringing it to the attention of the council but also of the country concerned and asking for a response in that area. Um, of course we, we welcome um, all of these advances and I think that they are all steps in the, in the right direction but these are largely patchwork responses um, and it can only go so far without a reinforced coordinated system-wide mechanism. Um, to point to a recent example, in fact, of this, uh, the visit of the Special Rapporteur on freedom, freedom of Religion to Vietnam, who had to abort parts of his visits to certain parts of the country upon information 
um, that individuals had faced reprisals before he had even met them. Um, so such kinds of examples, and of course of, of what our friend over um, here has also raised, um, requires that um, given that reprisals are very systematic, they deserve also a systematic response. If I can just follow up to that last point, and uh, as many in the room are aware, and uh, it was hinted at before, the General Assembly has still not acted on the Council's request for the Secretary General to designate the focal point on reprisals, who would then coordinate the, the, these patchwork responses. Um, can you maybe elaborate on that, and, and what you see as the implication of that non-decision of the GA? Um, to start with, I think I, I, it's important to say that um, the indecision that currently exists with what to do with Resolution 2424 does not connote um, an indecision of the Human Rights Council on how to act on reprisals. There is a clear um, concern that has been expressed by the Human Rights Council in previous resolutions. Um, in a number of um, council sessions that um, um, that reprisals are serious. Um, the one contentious point of Resolution 2424 is on the establishment of the UNY focal point. Um, and the discussions and the deliberations on this one area does not stop the President of the Human Rights Council and his Bureau and the member and observer states of the Human Rights Council to monitor cases of reprisals and to act on those which are brought to their attention. Um, on specifically the, the UN-wide focal point, um, we believe that there is um, an increasing case to be made of the importance of this focal point. Um, if you look at the most latest report of the Secretary General on reprisals, you will see that um, it includes some of the most grave examples of, um, of reprisals that have occurred. And I have to say that these are only the ones that have been submitted to the Secretary General. There are many that have not been submitted, many that believe that they want to maintain an anonymity. Um, I don't feel comfortable coming in, uh, public onto some of the requirements <coughs> that they have. Um, so, um, there have been substantial discussions in New York in recent months amongst groups of states, and of course, um, as many of you may know, that um, Ms. Jane Connors, who until recently was the head of OHCHS Special Procedures Branch, um, also engaged with a number of states in New York as well. Um, since res the resolution 2424 was adopted, there have been um, many calls for this UN-wide focal point. Um, the Secretary General himself, former High Commissioner Navi Pillay, the Council's own independent experts, and members of the treaty body have all clearly stressed that there is a need for this. And so we really hope that as the General Assembly sits in its 69th session right now, um, that they adopt very clear measures to facilitate and support the immediate appointment for this UN White um, focal point on reprisals. Um, I was asked to also welcome the efforts, particularly of Hungary, Botswana, Tunisia, and Ireland in moving these discussions forward in New York. And I also really want to acknowledge my colleague, Eleanor, who really should be here, um, uh, but isn't, again, because of flight-related issues, um, who has really been doing tremendous work in New York to keep civil society informed of the developments and, and how things are going there. Thank you, um, um, Pooja. Um, Stefania, the, the, the case of, of ADC Memorial is one of the cases that's in, in this year's report of the Secretary General, um, but I'm also aware that you've <coughs> tried um, to use regional mechanisms to, to address the situation and to challenge, um, to challenge what has happened to, to your organization. Would you like to, to expand on how you see the, the regional systems contributing to, to addressing the shrinking of space? Uh, well, it's 
so on. Uh, well, uh, we've been, of course, all organizations in Russia, and if we were the third one um, targeted uh, at the, uh, in the beginning of 2013, but by now there are many dozens of human rights organizations, including all the leading human rights organizations of Russia who, uh, fa uh, who faces similar reprisal, and uh, very many of them were actually put on the list of Ministry of Justice uh, organizations performing the function of a foreign agent, which is not so with us, which is a bit different from what one could understand from a film, but it's written that we were forced to put ourselves on the register. We were not forced, we were legally obliged, but we chose to close the organization. While many others, our colleagues and very respected organizations are on the list because the law was changed and after all, Minister of Justice, after two years of waiting until any NGO puts itself, while no one did, they started to put people uh, by force and obligatory without like, uh, any more volunteer action. All of us try to do international mechanism, mostly European Court of Human Rights. Some people uh, were very much waiting for the decision of Venice Commission. Some people went to the Constitutional Court of Russia. Our choice was European Court of Human Rights. We clearly explained in our complaint, which already has a number, just that uh, our organization was the best for our um, opinion, for our um, report. And uh, that is Article 10. Um, we also claim uh, the violation of the rights for freedom of association because the whole law violates actually for everybody in Russia, but definitely it also has to do with our case, therefore it's Article 11. And we also claim Article 14 because I see it as part of discriminative practice also towards people with political opinion and towards minorities who will protect and this way gets associated because our report was directly connected to the very painful for Russian society and Russian state problems, which is migration, ethnic minorities, and the LGBTI uh, organizations and activists, as you may know, uh, also very heavily depressed in Russia. And unfortunately, uh, Russian law and approach to LGBTI minorities influence the whole regional approach. And around Russia, the other states, mostly exalted um, republics, start to adopt similar rules. In this way, we are very much hoping for uh, some general uh, decision of maybe high court, maybe uh, not only on our complaint, we hope that it will be united, because there are very many different complaints already from the individuals of Russia. But unfortunately, for example, the decision of Venice Commission, which clearly said that this law doesn't correspond to freedom of expression, um, general civil society freedoms, Thank you, Stefania. Um, for, for, for outlining how you really try to gather the problem from all possible angles, and, and I'm sure uh, that will also be of interest to many, many civil society representatives in the room who are trying to define their own strategies to respond to their own shrinkage of space in their country. Um, I'm not going to invite you again uh, to ask, but please just feel free throughout the discussion to raise your hand and, and come in. Well, now I see the uh, Ambassador of Hungary. Thanks very much. Um, if I may start with a personal remark, um, uh, looking back of my 20 years of human rights experience at the UN, probably uh, the most remarkable moment was the adoption of 24-24. And um, time to time I ask myself whether I, I would have done something differently in light of what happened in New York. Uh, but my conclusion is that all the time is probably I, I would have done everything here in Geneva at least in the same way. I think that uh, there is a need for the focal point. Uh, and uh, the reactions of the other side showed actually <coughs> that how important it was. Because the first delegations who came to me to congratulate after the adoption of 24-24 were from the other side. Because personally, they also felt that they were on the wrong side of the story. Because they had the instructions to do something, uh, which they, most of them didn't uh, agree, or at least uh, some of them. Uh, and they admitted this uh, personally. So it shows that this uh, that the reprisal remained the last uh, tool for those uh, countries who want to uh, silence uh, critical voice in their country. 
So that's why for many delegations admitted to me that for them 24-24 during that session was the most important resolution uh, to, to, the, uh, to try to silence or, or try to block because, uh, because they realized that uh, by this, uh, if you will have a focal point and also publicity, because that's, that's the uh, main issue, if you have publicity, if you have visibility for these cases, that's probably the best way uh, uh, to address uh, this problem. And also, besides the focal point, it was very interesting that uh, those delegations who didn't want to have the focal point, they were very concerned uh, that they mentioned the role of the president of the council. So they said that no, the president, they shouldn't have a role uh, to address reprise. Uh, and also, they were not very happy that we mentioned uh, the different role of special procedures, treaty bodies. So actually, uh, you can see that uh, these countries are extremely afraid uh, of having a more coherent uh, address uh, or approach uh, to address uh, reprisal uh, cases. And, uh, and there was only one good effect uh, that 2424 uh, stopped in New York. Is actually now in New York, all the diplomats, they are there of reprisals because that was the most shocking experience for us. That here, those delegations who support the 2424 actually acted exactly in the opposite way in New York, uh, which means that there was a complete disconnect between New York and Geneva. Of course, in light of the fact that in Geneva the civil society is much more vibrant and the NGOs have much more rule than in New York, but still, I mean, they represented the same country. So that was really outrageous uh, for us uh, uh, in most of the cases. Actually, it was the human rights expert or the ambassador in New York who decided that we are not going to support 24-24 uh, against uh, the position, sometimes the, uh, the capital, but in most of the cases, the ambassador in Geneva, who was in a different view, and they told me that we told them that this is an excellent uh, 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 resolution, uh, especially in case of African countries. We had a very positive example here in Geneva, and we had a very negative example in New York. So I think this is also uh, an issue we have to address uh, that uh, in course of the next uh, uh, session of the GA, uh, we have to make it sure that all African and Asian and a few Latin American delegations who are very much concerned uh, 24 24 they should, uh, they should uh, understand uh, the problem and they should support uh, the adoption of uh, this resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Istvan. Um, if there's any questions, again, feel free to, to, to chip in. Um, uh, uh, continuing, um, though the ex exploring how, how international developments have, have evolved, um, I, I don't know, Ambassador Dupuy, if, you, if you'd like to, to come in again, but we've seen a number of, of uh, resolutions in the past few years passed at the Human Rights Council. Um, and I was wondering if you had any reflections on, on how you see the prospect of implementation of those resolutions at national level and what Uruguay is, is doing also in that regard. Just as a clarification on the resolutions, like the one on space for civil society. On space for civil society, on protection of human rights defenders. Um, well. If you wish to listen from the national perspective, uh, the national experience, of course, uh, Uruguay having had a, in the past uh, a dictatorship, our focus was to, to rebuild uh, or to regain our democratic society and all the guarantees of, uh, that, bring, that come with the rule of law. So in general, we didn't want to regulate too much. We don't have specific regulations for NGOs. We opted for the freedom, let's say, rather for the regulation, because normally regulations tend to be restrictive. But, of course, then you may find that you still have some problems in your legislation and so on, and so on to adjust. Uh, for example, we, we had at the time uh, something on defamation that was used or abused, because this is a problem. You have a, a criminal type that then is abusing the implementation. Uh, to, to restrict a, a journalist working on a corruption case, on a local corruption. And uh, then uh, we, we changed the law and also we invited the special rapporteur of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. That's why regional organizations are very important as well in these efforts. 
Um, and we did a symbolic, let's say, act of reparation uh, and so on with the person uh, itself, um, with, with the journalists, for example. But then we, we, create, we adopted other legislations that are important everywhere, for example, uh, on um, access to public information, but at the same time, with this access, you need to have the protection of personal data, uh, which gives you other guarantees, if not, uh, you may have problems on this side. Uh, or we created a national institution of human rights. At the beginning, uh, we were one of the latest in the region to create one, an independent <coughs> one, but uh, we thought we had solved it, uh, that with our general framework was enough. But then we found that uh, giving independent uh, mechanism uh, is it, always important. There, are, there will always be specific cases, not systematic cases, but uh, specific cases to address. So also a national mechanism of prevention of torture, strengthening them. We are still on the way, but uh, we, we, we are part of the OPCAT. So, so these are the type of um, national measures that, uh, that you can think uh, of. And we have as one of the members of our national institution, one person who used to try to come and speak at the old uh, Commission of Human Rights and usually had problems to, to speak. <laughs> Thank you very much for, for very uh, good practice, and I think that should then go in the compilation of, of, the, Irish, of the Irish resolution once it's, it's, it's passed. In view of the time, I'm going to ask um, our, our four panelists to, in, in one minute, so that we you know, finish at the time we indicated, to, to sum up what they see as, as the, the one or two actions that states and other relevant actors um, could take to address all of the, the problems that we've um, spend a lot of time exploring today um, and, and I'll, I'll ask each of you to, to focus on uh, on a specific aspect so Clément um, at, at the African level both nationally and, and regionally what do you see as the critical steps that, that states and other actors should take to address this problem? Oui, uh, merci Michael. Uh, je pense qu'au niveau de la Commission africaine c'est clair il y a déjà des étapes qui ont été uh, déjà affranchies uh, la première a été l'adoption de la résolution en 2011 et cette résolution uh, a été renforcée par une autre résolution qui met en place un système, un mécanisme de collecte des cas parce que jusqu'à présent la pratique de la commission africaine c'était lorsqu'il y a un cas de représailles, la commission appelait à la fois l'État et le défenseur et, et on s'asseyait ensemble alors la commission essayait de prendre les garanties nécessaires pour que le défenseur puisse retourner. Mais on a constaté que les cas ont continué par augmenter. Donc la commission s'est dit, il n'y a pas qu'au niveau des sessions de la commission, mais lorsque la commission aussi se débat dans les pays. Donc là, la commission a mandaté maintenant un point focal pour pouvoir compiler des cas qui seront présentés en session plénière. Et on demande, la présidente de la commission demandera aux États concernés de donner des réponses dans un délai précis. Ah. Je voudrais aussi dire que depuis, depuis la première résolution, il y a eu une certaine évolution au niveau national. Et j'aimerais citer le cas de la Côte d'Ivoire. Et, et puis aussi vous, vous inviter vivement aussi à, 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 à regarder la loi de la Côte d'Ivoire en son article 5, article 7 et article 6. Elle est claire. La loi reconnaît la, le droit des défenseurs des droits de l'homme de pouvoir saisir les mécanismes au niveau international. Cela constitue déjà, puisque c'est une loi, ça constitue une garantie au niveau national. La loi reconnaît aussi l'inviolabilité du siège des, des défenseurs des droits de l'homme et accorde d'ailleurs aux défenseurs des droits de l'homme en son article 5 l'immunité la, la, euh, de toute forme de poursuite liée à leur travail de défenseur des droits de l'homme. Donc je pense que là, il y a des garanties au niveau national qui sont conformes à ce que le système régional veut. Au Burkina Faso, nous avons encore des informations qu'une loi paraît est en cours de développement. Au Mali, cela se passe. Je pense que beaucoup de, certains États de l'Ordre du Sud et surtout les États qui actuellement sont dans le sens inverse, c'est-à-dire dans le sens de restriction, doivent suivre maintenant le cours des États qui sont en train de reconnaître le droit, l'espace de la société civile, non seulement au niveau national, mais aussi au niveau international. Parce que par le passé, on parlait juste uniquement du niveau national, mais aujourd'hui, les États reconnaissent le droit des défenseurs des droits de l'homme de pouvoir saisir ces mécanismes. Et je vous inviterai vivement à lire cette loi de la Côte d'Ivoire et vous verrez, euh, vous verrez en sorte qu'il y a de bonnes pratiques 
et, et j'espère que euh, beaucoup d'États vont le suivre. Et pour finir en ce sens, j'aimerais aussi dire que, comme je l'ai souligné au début, que rien ne justifie les représailles. Rien ne justifie les représailles parce que les États ont, ont la possibilité de pouvoir fournir des informations contraires. Donc, il n'y a pas de base légale. Et exercer des représailles, c'est empêcher ces mécanismes de fonctionner. C'est aussi insulter les experts. Parce que c'est dire expressément que les experts n'ont pas la faculté de faire la part des choses. Et cela est une, est une, est une honte, à la fois pour les experts des droits de l'homme dans les missions diplomatiques, mais aussi pour les experts des droits de l'homme dans les systèmes internationaux. J'espère que là, nous allons renverser la tendance et faire comprendre qu'on euh, ne peut pas promouvoir les droits de l'homme sans donner la possibilité à tout individu de pouvoir apporter les plus nécessaires, de pouvoir apporter sa contribution à la promotion, à la protection des droits. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Clément. Um, Patricia, I, we know that the, the most important step is the passage by consensus of your resolution. But beyond that, what, what, what do you expect the UN states here to take? Thank you. I'll try to do this in 60 seconds. You said it. Our resolution is our priority for the moment. A small but vital, important step. It's not enough, but it's probably about as much, sadly, as the Council can cope with at the moment. But it is vital, having said that. The second is that there needs to be, and this is part of all of that, a public recognition by states of the positive partnership role of civil society. This needs to be trumpeted every day. Trumpeted loudly and clearly by all of us and by civil society and by states and governments. In addition, there needs to be accountability <coughs> for reprisals. We can't simply talk about reprisals being unacceptable. We must talk about accountability. And when we talk about accountability, we must know what we're talking about. We're talking about real accountability, investigations and a follow-up to investigations and a response to situations of reprisals where those who are initiating and committing those reprisals are made to feel accountable in a very real sense. Of course, we pick up on the, on the Secretary General's reports about this worsening trend, which threatens to undermine the credibility, integrity, and the very heart of our work in the Council, and indeed in the UN itself. So I was really touched by the, the rather beautifully phrased um, expression of Pujas earlier about the sacred space of the council. In my year here, it's probably been said many, many times, but I've never registered it. And I now register it as an acknowledgement of the sacredness and the specialness um, of the council, particularly for those states where uh, freedom of expression, opinion, association, assembly are constantly under threat. And this adds another responsibility for all of us working in the Council to ensure that that sacredness is protected. So finally, we support the full implementation of the Human Rights Council Resolution 2424. I think that goes without saying. Thank you. More than 60 seconds. Thank you. 62 seconds. <laughs> um, Ucha, what, what are the steps necessary not just to maintain the Council as a sacred space, but also to, to translate the the expression of need of protecting civil society space and preventing the crisis to the national level. Um, I will be repeating what uh, others on this panel have already said, but I think, again, these things are worth repeating. Um, firstly, it's important that states enact and ensure the implementation of specific national laws and policies in the protection of human rights defenders. Um, this would ensure a full implementation of the UN Declaration on Human Rights Defenders. Um, for human rights organizations that are operating in many of these countries, it's very important to remove restrictions on um, access to foreign funding as well as on arduous registration processes for NGOs. These forms of restrictions only serve to suppress and contain the work of human rights defenders. Um, and they pose existential threats, in essence. Um, as Ambassador O'Brien has mentioned as well, uh, impunity prevails over a vast majority of reprisals cases. There must be accountability for this. Um, as I had said before, the state has the primary responsibility to ensure this, but the UN has a clear obligation as well. 
We hope also that the President of the Human Rights Council and his Bureau um, address allegations of reprisals, especially those that are brought to their attention specifically, including by bringing it to the attention of all member and observer states of the Council, and to follow up bilaterally with the country concerned as well. Um, again, uh, it is our hope that states will be expeditious in setting up the UN-wide focal point on reprisals. We believe that this focal point also has an important role to play in prevention to ensure that this recurrence um, is stopped. Thank you very much, Pucha, uh, and, and uh, to give uh, Stefania the, the last word. Um, I, I'm interested to, to hear from you what you see as the next steps, and particularly what you expect from the international community, states, but also civil society in this room to support ABC Memorial yourself and your colleague in, in, in the, the struggle and in defending yourself against the shrinking of <coughs> I think uh, everybody in the world, everybody in the UN Council should agree and make it very clear, not only in resolution but in general approach to human rights, that human rights are a universal value for the whole world and cannot be seen as an interest of one country and against another. It's impossible to call people who are in fact agents of human rights foreign agents. It's impossible to call them new wording of our president toward us the national traitors. It's impossible to um, distinguish uh, some traditional values as as important or more important than human rights. We all know that within the Human Rights Council of the UN and other international bodies, all the countries have the only obligation to fulfill international law obligations and human rights um, conventions they ratify. It's not uh, similarly important, and it's not in fact possible to declare any other values as more important for one country or for a group of countries, which avoids me very much the approach of traditional values against human rights, the approach of Western values against all other values. And we know it's absolutely the same rhetoric in Africa and Russia against LGBT people, but it's just human rights for your identity and your fear of freedom of expression. And this is universal, it's not European, American, or Western, it's everywhere. And I think we need not only some resolutions and documents, but we need a very strong general um, campaigning and uh, making it clear on all the well level, on the, so on the sociological level, because society also has to support this point. I know there are too many people in the modern world who are not ready to agree on human rights as the most important value, but it's actually an obligation of the state and the federal person individually to see human rights more important than um, the local interest, or political interest, or traditional values. Thank you very much, uh, Stefania, and uh, I hope you will all join me in thanking the, the panelists, thanking also the interpreter, and thanking all, all of you for, for your interests and the important contributions. Um, I've really enjoyed this conversation and it's, as uh, Stefania has said, there's, there's a long way to go and we'll definitely make sure to continue this conversation with all of you. Thank you.